Good afternoon, everybody. Um, Mark Lilick, uh, Mike Kutch has expressed his uh, apologies for not being here. He had a scheduling conflict, so couldn't be around. But uh, I am actually responsible for supporting tokenization within MasterCard's Emerging Payments Group, specifically driving it from a network message perspective, including it in all our network messages globally to provide global interoperability uh, to support this concept of tokenization. I guess before we get into the slides, and I have a couple here to kind of just walk through um, what tokenization is, I think I first probably need to define tokenization the way we're looking at it from a payments industry perspective. Tokenization is the process in which a bank issued primary account number has been replaced with a non affiliated account number with some unique dynamic details that will be present in transactions, whether card present transactions or contactless transactions or card not present transactions, things you typically would see with e-commerce. So tokenization is a pretty important piece, but we have a really big role model in tokenization, something we're striving to achieve in the card not present world specifically. And it's trying to do what EMV has done in the market for um, for the fact that it has provided security and, and stability and, and acceptance uh, for transactions in the marketplace. There's two things that EMV does very well. First, each transaction is unique. Second, the containment of the values that make those transactions unique are in a very sturdy container. And it's very hard to get into that container and to get that information and replicate it in their markets. And this model is obviously the reason why EMV migration is important in the marketplace because of the uniqueness that the issuer could validate on the transaction level. And it's extremely important for the device that's being issued to be able to hold on to that secret and not share it with anybody it's not intended to be shared with. So when we start looking at EMV, we realize that's card present and specifically card being dipped into reader. We have different um, models out here where cards really aren't present, right? It's uh, an instance where you have a product like a mobile phone that's capable of doing um, e-com transactions, in-app application uh, e-commerce transactions, or you have laptops or tablets. Um, I don't see a picture of a PC here. I don't think anybody has a PC anymore. But, you know, there's different instances where you're going to see transactions taking place outside of card form. And um, there's really two ways you get this information into these various containers. And these really, in fact, are all containers, right? So there's containers that have secure element chips in it, like NFC devices. And there's containers or server base that sit uh, in card and file merchants or digital wallet back offices. But all these different containers are going to get information from one of two ways. Um, there's an in instance where an issuer will populate one of those containers specifically uh, by personalizing data into the secure element of that mobile device. So in this instance, an issuer has made the conscious effort to communicate to a person's handheld device and provide the necessary credentials and uniqueness that will be validated with every single transaction. And that's a, one way that you populate one of those containers. And that adds significant value in the marketplace. And similar to EMV, it adds that level of assurance that the transaction is unique. There are some challenges with that that is impacting some scale. And the first challenge is that an issuer has to make the conscious effort to build the infrastructure to support that and has to build the framework and relationships with all the different players outside of card issuance to make that happen. So it's definitely a plausible scenario and has a very good business model and application. The challenge is that the issuer has to make that invest and be able to do that. So that's one example of how you get this information contained in those various devices. The other side of it, which is the more common and more scalable side, is the consumer itself. They are the ones inputting data uh, in their containers on the mobile device or on the e-com side through a digital wallet. And the data they're inputting is actually based off of their card, right? So it's static, right? It's data that's in the front of the card, maybe in the back of the card, but it's nonetheless data that is present on a card that they would be inputting themselves. Now, that obviously promotes scalability, but it puts a lot of emphasis on the various containers managed by the handset manufacturers or even the merchants to hold on to that data and to keep it 
uh, secure and make sure that it's, it's intact and that to make sure that it does not fall it's susceptible to compromise. So, but even then when you do, if that ever does happen where it is compromised, that data could be captured and could be used in some other instances that are not intended for its use. So this is kind of the current landscape that's out there today and tokenization as it, ex it provides us with a framework to figure out how do we get to providing something where um, payment cards uh, don't necessarily have to rely on, um, you know, containers for consumers to input this information. There's another mechanism or another method to be able to do that. So um, the concept of tokenization, and yesterday uh, Brian Byrne was talking through EMV Co, big flow chart on tokenization and describing all the different players to support tokenization. I didn't introduce that chart here because um, EMV Co is currently driving that initiative and they're actually working with the payment brands collectively to figure out how those frameworks are going to be applied and what specifications are coming out of that. I'm just simply bringing a brand's perspective that tokenization is bringing convenience in the sense that if there's a token service provider, an entity that uh, knows who's requesting from the container and can validate that container, then it becomes a lot easier to basically exchange the data of this uh, primary account number that the consumer has in, in place of a token that could then be used for subsequent transactions after that binding has taken effect. And this token service provider is going to play an important role in provisioning a token to one of these containers, but it's also going to play a role in regards to transactions. Because as I said earlier, our, our role model is EMV, so it's not just enough to put a value in there that's not associated with the original funding account number. It's providing some level of uniqueness to that transaction that could be validated. So the token service provider when it sees the token coming through in an authorization message, one of the other responsibilities a token service provider does is it takes the token and the credentials associated with that token and it will validate if this is appropriate for its domain, if this was intended to originate in this area before it could allow for the conversion or the detokenization and replacing it with the funding account number that goes back to the issuer for the authorization to be complete. That token service provider is taking on that role to be able to decrypt, uh, detokenize, and then do that uh, conversion. And then ultimately when the response comes back from the issuer for approval or, or to not to approve the transaction for whatever the reason is, they will then retokenize and send it back down to the merchant so they know that the, uh, the token is really the only thing that the merchant will see for authorization uh, requests and responses to, again, keep the merchant intact so they don't have to touch the original funding account number in any way, shape, or form for those transactions. Um, in regards to the value chain and ultimately all the things that will happen across the chain to support tokenization, um, there's been a lot of questions in the market saying, well, how is this going to impact how I do processing of transactions? Is tokenization going to be significant? Uh, do I have to make significant investments to do this if I'm an acquirer or processor or if I'm an issuer? And I, I guess to just kind of keep it high level, you know, the concept of tokenization is not to create new standards or new rails to do things. It's more or less trying to take these values, these unique values, these values that ultimately could mimic what is the original card number. So it could be, in my case, a 16-digit uh, account number. It could have dynamic details that are equivalent to what you would see for a dynamic CVC value, what we call it, or an ARQC-like value. So it could have all these different components that make those transactions unique, but fit in the existing excuse me, fit in the existing framework of those network messages. So we're not asking um, the financial industry, the acquirers or processors to change how they do the transaction processing of a token. We're not asking the point of sale from a contactless perspective to change how they manage a tokenization. It's really leveraging the current framework in place. And that's what EMV Co is trying to establish is what do we need to do to make that happen? So those are all some of the things we're looking to do from a tokenization perspective. Um, our overall goal with tokenization and MasterCard, I'm just speaking on our behalf, is we're really excited this is actually happening because it actually promotes 
uh, contact uh, growth and usage of new devices in the marketplace leveraging these rails because these rails are global in nature and allows for merchants to be able to leverage these tokens in these ca this capacity. It allows for more devices to be able to use this. The consumer experience will be seamless because again the interaction will be pretty much the same as they have it for their day-to-day -day purchases today. Um, and the issuer will be happy because then the infrastructure that they had to make earlier for some of those implementations, they may not necessarily have to do for this specific instance because there may be um, on behalf of services provided by other entities in the value chain that could manage some of that for them. So our next steps really for tokenization this year are to uh, finish the work we have within the EMV code. There's a work group currently underway. Uh, with all the payment brands to be able to identify how tokenization is going to take effect. Uh, there will be a uh, draft published later on this year, which will then be shared with all the standards groups out in the market to review and to assess how tokens will be incorporated within their network, within the existing ISO messages that are out in the market for those standards. And then subsequently there will be changes reflected uh, specifically in MasterCard's infrastructure to support tokenization from a network perspective and to provide on behalf of services so that if any issuer or any device would like to leverage tokens, they can do so with the rails and framework that we have in place. So that's kind of our high level view of tokenization from a payment perspective. Um, I'm going to see if we'll see the questions for you at the end and I'll just pass it over to uh, Troy or 